I feel obligated now to shoot a video today that furthers out this discussion only because there are some people who I think are just unable to hear what's actually being said. Uh, some gentleman here, partly a response to this fellow Noah, uh, I have no idea the sort of self-congratulatory ramblings of this person who didn't understand, I think, a word that was said. It's really odd. It's like as soon as you suggest that there is a limit to the kinds of explanation that evolutionary psychology can have. And, you know, evolutionary biology, I'm on board with. Evolutionary psychology is a lot more iffy. I think that's an important distinction the person was equivocating on. The difference between cultural evolution and natural evolution, I'm, I want to hear the video that really rubs those blurred for me. For me, as much as we want to say, there is a sort of continuation that human cultures are a part of natural evolution. Okay, I think we can grant that, but I don't think, I, I'm not ready to get on board with the alphabet is somehow natural in the way writing was. See, this would take us a long time to talk about, but let's get it. I'm going to, I'm going to digress just for a second here. According to a great amount of research here on this. And please, do your homework. You, you don't have to believe me. Go look at the whole tradition that came out of McLuhan, the whole Toronto media studies, the media ecology tradition. Look, writing systems are indigenous to the human. We can find all kinds of writing throughout uh, different cultures at different epochs. Um, the question of when did phonetic writing get created or discovered. See now, there, there is a sense in which other forms of writing are kind of created. Phonetic writing, the, the move to the rebus, where you're starting to have visual elements mean sounds, some people would say it was a kind of creation, some people would argue it was kind of a discovery. The, the, line, re, the line between discovery and creation starts to get blurry. By the time you get to the alphabet, and I mean the alphabet, you have a discovery, and it was discovered once, and once the alphabet was discovered, there was no point of ever discovering another one. You, the alphabet is a principle. It's the principle of the visual discovery of what the ear is unable to identify. It's the subatomic fragment of the syllable. Okay, Take the names for our letters B, D, C, E. Those are the names for our letters. B, C, D, E. They all have the E sound. What the Greeks did, see people say that the, the Greeks took the Phoenician alphabet and added vowels. No, what the Greeks did is they discovered the pure consonant. They discovered the B, independent of the B, C, D. That is, the, the subatomic fragment was a discovery, and it had largely to do with the fact that the, it was a seaport and uh, Greece had lots of trade and there were different languages coming together in different phonetic systems that were misaligned and the Greeks sort of discovered that. The point about phonetic text and the role that phonetic text in particular played in the role of science in the promoting of visual ideals, uh, its relation literacy's relationship to numeracy and the way that literacy and number run together. I, I think that people don't seem to realize how much that literacy is something that is culturally passed on and is not simply bestowed upon people in a way that speech doesn't require formal instruction. You don't have to go to school to learn to speak. If you don't go to school, you're, you're very likely to not learn to read. The fact that this person wasn't able to really address this, I think that's really funny. Um, I don't know what to say here about, to me, one of the most important issues in trying to understand cultural evolution is that cultural evolution, rather than just natural evolution, it points forward. It points to a praxis. It's not to say that there's no value to evolutionary psychology. That's, that's stupid. Who would say that? Did I ever say that? I can't believe that someone would say that I said that. Uh, what I was suggesting is that people are learning to play an explanation game on themselves. That's what they're doing. They're facing situations 
and it, it can be useful sometimes. I want to admit that. There can be normative data that evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology can tell us that helps alleviate people's sense of guilt because they have overdrawn expectations and then some of this normative data, this evolutionary data, it provides a context and it says, hey, wait, this is kind of how people are and what the range of human behaviors are and what it is. As much as that can be useful, it also can pose a problem because people can, in their everyday lives, start to use those, those data sets or that information as a rationalization for why they're going to do what they're going to do. And there's a difference between explaining things and explaining how you got to be the way you are. That is an interesting issue and that can be relevant, but that's very different than talking with one another and navigating toward a future. It seems like the more that people think that they can just explain and not do any interpretations, what they're denying is that humans are a kind of temporal event that we become, that is, we're becoming something in terms of the explanations that we accept. And so to that extent, they are interpretations. I mean, to try to set a hard line distinction between scientific explanations and then all oh, those in, those sort of qualitative interpretations that people want to give about why people do what they do, uh, you could try to draw that line. The problem is that everyday individuals in their everyday lives, as they're facing practical problems, that information is used by them. Now, there could be processes that are governing them, but those will be true in an evolutionary biology psychology way, whether they know about them or not. Our talk about them becomes part of the impact. That's what I think I've been trying to stress. At no point, I'm going to say one last time, at no point am I ever saying that it's not relevant, it's not useful. The problem is what is the difference between trying to talk about, let's just say for example, the evolutionary psychology of apes or the evolutionary psychology of other animals where our understanding of their own evolution doesn't impact them. That is, they don't model themselves off the theories that we have of why, we're, why they're doing what they're doing. But when we start to theorize ourselves, it's not so simple, it's not so easy. This person, I think as many people do out there who adhere to what I would call a scientism, I don't think they know that much about science, uh, not, not honestly, I think what they're doing... It, it, or they're accusing other people of not knowing that much. They want to armchair it and suggest that, oh, no one really knows it the way they do. Uh, boy, it's really presumptuous in the electric age. Uh, at any rate, th the problem is the difference between these modes of, of understanding. I think a detached posture which allows us to explain stuff in the world can be very useful. It might even be useful in certain ways to understand ourselves that way. But to simply reduce all of what we're doing to being the outcome of what had survival value or to try to reduce the, to try to reduce the parameters of how we're supposed to talk about why we do what we do to a sort of authority in science and say, well, look, this is really what it is. To me, the, the interesting point is that we do have a natural, and I mean a genetic hard wiring bestowal towards speech, and to that extent speech is kind of secured. Literacy is not. It's a little blip in human history. It's a tiny little... Um, it was an achievement, a periodic achievement, and I'm, I'm partly concerned that it could be lost. I think some people who rely upon explanation, they maybe don't they don't see that right now we are at a great cultural change and it's a cultural change that we could conceivably lose literacy in several generations. Now, will it happen? I don't think so. What I'm witnessing in my work is a, a, a rapid divide. It's not that people are getting dumber, but it's not that people are getting smarter. What I see is more and more divide. More and more people on my exams are shredders who are, they're ferocious, and more and more people are lagging behind. They can't do the reading. And that divide is going to get wider and wider. That, to me, seems to be a cultural issue. Has biological backdrop, for sure, but to simply reduce it to evolutionary biology psychology misses the media ecological issue. Thanks.